Greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Um, being so timely, we're going to give it a couple minutes for others to join. So we'll get started in just a few. Uh, but in the meantime, please do utilize a chat box to share with us who you are and where you're joining us from today on World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone, for being so timely. Again, we'll get started in a minute or so. Please continue to utilize the chat box and share where you're joining us from today. We see folks from your Rhode Island, Texas, Wyoming, New York, Virginia. So please continue to share with us where you're joining us from, and we'll We'll get started in a minute. Fantastic. All right. Well, I see um, so many of you joining us already, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And again, just please continue to utilize the chat box to share us, share with us where you're from, what your WEAD plans are today outside of this webinar, and we can go ahead and get started now. Greetings and happy World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. I'm Kimmy Moon and I serve as project coordinator at the National Center on Elder Abuse, a resource center funded by the Administration for Community Living and situated at the Keck School of Medicine of USC. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome you all to today's event. Federal partners take on the We Add 615 Challenge as we come together to showcase our interagency collaborations with the latest data and resources to help you raise awareness all year long. Before we dive in, I'd like to quickly go over some housekeeping items. Uh, please note that all attendees are here in listen only mode, but we encourage you to utilize a chat box to share with us uh, where you're joining us from today and also share with us any other we at plans that you may have today or this afternoon uh, or this week. We also encourage you to utilize the Q&A function to submit any questions, and we will try to address as many as we can at the end of today's session. Please also note that the recording and all presentation materials will be made available uh, via the National Center on Elder Abuse on our website at ncea.acl.gov, and you will also be emailed um, with all these materials at the conclusion of today's event. Uh, last but not least, of course, your feedback matters to us, so please do complete the very short evaluation survey that we will be shared, and we'd love to hear your feedback so that we can enhance these events as we host more in the future. So before we dive in again, uh, just quickly introducing the National Center on Elder Abuse for those who may not be familiar with our work. The NCEA, again, we're funded by the Administration for Community Living and situated at the Keck School of Medicine of USC. And we strive to improve the national response to elder abuse, neglect, and exploitation. And we do this by disseminating elder abuse information to professionals and the, and the public. And we also provide technical assistance and training to states and community-based organizations. 
For example, some of the work that we do is we make news and resources available online and in easy to use formats. We collaborate on research, provide training, identify um, information about promising practices and interventions, operate a very robust listserv forum for professionals, and we provide subject matter expertise on program development. One of the main projects that we so proudly undertake at the National Center on Elder Abuse is our annual Nations World Elder Abuse Awareness Day campaign. So WEAD was launched in 2006 by the International Network for the Prevention of Elder Abuse and the World Health Organization at the United Nations in an effort to unite communities around the world in raising awareness on what elder abuse is and why it occurs but most importantly, what we can all do to prevent abuse from happening in the first place. And this year will be my seventh World Elder Abuse Awareness Day campaign with the NCEA team. And it has just been so amazing to see our campaign's growth each year and more exciting to see all the local innovations and collaborations highlighted through local WIA campaigns. One way that we're seeing local organizations and state organizations spread awareness of WIAD is through NCEA's bookmark campaign. I'm proud to share that the NCEA, we have disseminated over 100,000 bookmarks in English and Spanish to um, over 166 agencies in 40 states. And many of these agencies also requested um, campaign day stickers, as you can see on the slide. So we're able to proudly um, promote this event throughout our networks. Uh, information about bookmarks and sticker requests for next year will be going out um, in early 2023, around March through our listserv. So if you are not signed up to receive our newsletters and our listserv updates, we encourage that you do so, so that you don't miss the opportunity to request these materials for your local event next year. Another way that we have seen our campaign grow and adopted by many local agencies is um, our virtual awareness walk, Walk for WIAD. This year, we are so excited to share that we have had over 100, sorry, not 100, 930 participants. And um, those individuals belonging to 82 different teams, collectively taking 148 million steps, which is equivalent to three trips across the globe. I just want to give a few shout outs to some states with the highest number of participants. We have California with 97 participants participating in uh, Walk for WIAD. In Ohio, we have 94 participants. And then in New Jersey, we have 76 participants. Just as a reminder for those participating in Walk for WIAD, um, the campaign officially closes midnight tonight, so please do remember to log all of your steps so that all of that is recorded. Next, I'd like to turn your attention to our WIAD events gallery. So uh, we encourage you to submit your WIAD photos onto our gallery, share photos of your events, awareness activities, and purple outfits um, so that we can be showcasing this sometime in July posted on our website. Uh, last year, we received over 300 photos from commemorations all over the world, even received a photo from a Stir a Cup purple tea event at a refugee camp in Iraq. So we again see that we had really is a global event and encourage you to share with us um, photos, beautiful photos that we can display um, with a lot of purple. So now I'd like to turn your attention to the topic of today's webinar, which is the We Had 615 Challenge. And this challenge was uh, introduced last year as an engaging way to inform, educate, and empower others to be part of the solution to end elder abuse. And it takes just three easy steps to participate. Uh, first, you list six facts about elder abuse that everyone should know share one thing that you can do to prevent elder abuse, and then tag five people to participate in the challenge themselves. So this year, federal agencies will take on this challenge with a twist. So we're gonna be sharing six facts about elder abuse based on our agency perspectives, share one action that the agency will take to prevent elder abuse, and share five resources or tips you can use to promote elder justice all year long. 
So now, before we dive into today's uh, session, I'd like to introduce our exciting lineup of presenters. First, we have Mr. Edwin Walker, who joins us as the De Deputy Assistant Secretary for Aging of the Administration on Aging within the Administration for Community Living. Mr. Walker serves as the Chief Career Official for the Federal Agency, uh, responsible for advocating on behalf of older Americans. In this capacity, he guides and promotes the development of home and community-based long-term care programs, policies, and services designed to afford older people and their caregivers the ability to age with dignity and independence and to have a broad array of options available for an enhanced quality of life. Next, we have Dr. Susan Lynch, who serves as Senior Counsel for the Elder Justice Initiative at the U.S. Department of Justice, where she has been civilly prosecuting healthcare fraud cases for over 20 years. Dr. Lynch is the Department Expert on Failure of Care Nursing Home Cases and is the National Lead for the Department's 10 Elder Justice Task Forces across the nation. Uh, next, we have Ms. Suzanne McGovern, who is Senior Advisor in the Office of Investor Education and Advocacy at the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, or SEC. She previously served as Assistant Director in the SEC's Office of Compliance, Inspections and Examinations, Broker-Dealer Exchange Examination Program. Prior to joining the Commission, Ms. McGovern worked for multiple Wall Street firms, primarily in supervisory and compliance roles, but her experience includes sales, trading, and back office operations. Next, we have Ms. Lydia Chevere from the Public Affairs um, Office within the Social Security Administration, where she is the Public Affairs Specialist, and she is responsible for carrying out public information projects to improve the public's understanding of the various Social Security programs. Next, we have Ms. Deborah Royster, who serves as Assistant Director for the Older Americans, Office of Older Americans at the U.S. Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, or CFPB. In this role, Ms. Royster leads a team of talented mission-driven professionals to advance the mission of the Office for Older Americans to help protect older consumers across the nation from financial harm and to help older consumers make sound financial decisions as they grow older. Next, we have Ms. Erin Shaithi also joining us from CFPB's Office of Older Americans, where she serves as Outreach Specialist for the Office of Older Americans. Um, prior to joining the CFPB, she served as the Vice President of Grassroots at the American Bankers Association, and she was responsible for encouraging bankers to engage with their members of Congress. Next, we have Ms. Nicole Lebeau, um, who directs the Senior Medicare Patrol, or SMP, National Resource Center, which she joined in 2015. In her current role as director, she is responsible for the center's coordinating efforts uh, with ACL, um, grant management, contract management, and technical assistance in developing written materials, webinars, and other center products. Uh, last but not least, we have Dr. Laura Mosqueda, who is director of the National Center on Elder Abuse and professor of family medicine and geriatrics at the Keck School of Medicine of the University of Southern California. Dr. Mosqueda is a widely respected authority on elder abuse and care of older adults and the underserved. Uh, since joining the Keck School of Medicine, her roles have included Chair of the Department of Family Medicine, Associate Dean of Primary Care, and Dean of the Keck School of Medicine. As a clinician, researcher, educator, and academic administrator, she has a very unique perspective that is informed by her extensive experiences in the community, including her role as a long-term care volunteer ombudsman. I want to thank our presenters today for their willingness to take on the We Add 615 challenge and for our partners for their ongoing collaboration. Uh, we have a lot of presenters today with a lot of great information. So without further ado, let's jump into today's program.
Hello, everyone, and greetings. I'm Edwin Walker from the Administration for Community Living, and I just wanted to just say hello on World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. I'm so privileged to join you all in commemorating the 17th World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. You know, it's also a day that is for the third year taking place during one of the most challenging times in our nation's history as COVID-19 and its variants continue to impact our everyday lives in innumerable ways. On behalf of the entire ACL team, I want to reaffirm our deep and abiding commitment to advancing equity, racial justice, inclusion, and equal opportunity in all that we do, including ensuring that people from underrepresented and underserved communities are at the table to inform our work to reducing new threats and new challenges of abuse, neglect, and exploitation that ACL and all of its federal partners simply must address. These principles are foundational to us and from the outset have been central to both the Older Americans Act since its enactment and the enactment of the Elder Justice Act in 2010. I'm so pleased to be among my colleagues today representing ACL, within our Elder Justice Coordinating Council family of federal departments and demonstrating our continued coordination to address elder rights and elder justice. During World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, we have an opportunity, and in fact, we have a responsibility to join together to raise awareness of elder abuse, neglect, and exploitation. With one voice, communities around the world encourage all of us to join the movement toward elder justice. And while we commemorate World Elder Abuse Awareness Day once per year, it's the full-time mission of ACL to address abuse, neglect, and exploitation of older adults and adults with disabilities every day. We dialogue and collaborate with colleagues, stakeholders, and partners to implement programmatic and policy enhancements every single day. We support and provide technical assistance to our partners and those who are the boots on the ground working day to day so together we can advance elder justice and elder rights. And one, one way we invest in elder justice and elder rights is through grant making. This year alone, we are awarding $6 million for demonstration projects to explore, explore strategies to improve outcomes for APS clients, to improve state guardianship systems, and to test approaches to better serve APS clients impacted by the opioids and substance abuse epidemics. And we are most excited to announce that this year we're able to provide from the American Rescue Plan Act $163 million to APS programs in all states, the District of Columbia, and territories. And this is in addition to the $180 million we awarded last year. A few examples of how states are using this historic investment are establishing multidisciplinary teams and including adult abuse forensic centers, increasing the availability of wraparound services for clients, responding to at-risk situations by making resources available for earlier prevention activities to stabilize living situations, and developing partnerships and interagency agreements between tribal elder justice and adult protective service programs. We continue to, to expand funding to the long-term care ombudsman programs in order to remain engaged and connected to residents of long-term congregate settings on critical issues such as in-person visitation, rights to readmission following hospitalization, and rights to remain in their own homes uh, within these settings and not be forced out against their will. Our efforts are agency-wide as well. June 2022 marks the 25th anniversary of the Senior Medicare Patrol Program, another ACL-administered program which focuses on empowering and assisting Medicare beneficiaries, their families, and their caregivers to prevent, detect, and report healthcare fraud, errors, and abuse. Medicare loses an estimated $60 billion each year due to fraud, errors, and abuse. And every day, issues related to these losses affect people across the country, 
often resulting in the loss of money, time, and well-being. To, to commemorate its 25th anniversary, the Senior Medicare Patrol Program created Medicare Fraud Prevention Week from June 5th to the 11th to focus on the actions that everyone can take to prevent Medicare fraud and abuse. Its campaign is intended to teach beneficiaries, their loved ones and caregivers, medical providers, and our communities, how they can best protect against Medicare fraud. For this year's World Elder Abuse Awareness Day webinar, each of us was asked to take on the 615 challenge. So here is what, what you can do and what, you, what I want you to take away from today. The six facts about elder abuse that everyone should know. Number one, elder abuse can happen to anyone. An estimated 10% of Americans 60 years of age and over have experienced some form of elder abuse. Number two, Elder abuse, sadly, isn't going away. In fact, rates of elder abuse have increased 83% during the COVID-19 pandemic. Number three, lack of a support system and social isolation increase the risk of abuse, neglect, and exploitation. Four, elder abuse is often a silent problem that robbed, robbed seniors of their dignity, their security, their money, and in some cases, really cost them their lives. Number five, elder abuse can lead to serious long-term physical injuries and psychological consequences. And number six, most cases of elder abuse are perpetrated by people known to and entrusted relationships with older people. This includes family, friends, neighbors, and care providers. So what's the one thing you can do to prevent elder abuse? Don't be silent. Talk to family, friends, and neighbors about what it means to age well and to avoid scams. Check in on older adults, especially those who may have few friends and family members. It's the number one thing we can all do to prevent social isolation. And let me leave you with five tips and resources on elder abuse prevention. Number one, listen to older adults and their caregivers to understand their challenges and to provide support. If you see something, say something. Ask how an older person is doing. Let them know if you're concerned. Report suspected abuse to local adult protective services, the long-term care ombudsman program, or to the local police department. Number three, learn how the signs of elder abuse differ from the signs of normal aging. Number four, visit ACL's Elder Justice website at elderjustice.acl.gov. It has a ton of information and resources on elder abuse, elder rights, and elder justice. And five, download a copy of the Talking Elder Abuse Toolkit a joint project of ACL's National Center on Elder Abuse and the Frameworks Institute. It's a great resource for learning how to improve our communications about elder abuse and how to increase public engagement. And finally, thank you for joining us today and thank you for allowing me to share my thoughts with you. I commend our partners and our resource centers for all that you do to address and to mitigate adult maltreatment and to promote elder rights, elder justice, and independence for all. And as I mentioned earlier, ACL is proud of our leadership role in coordinating elder justice efforts across the federal government through the Elder Justice Coordinating Council. You'll soon hear from some of our Elder Justice Coordinating Council partners about their incredible work that amplifies the issues of elder justice. And as you listen, I urge all of us to take inspiration from what, you, what they share about taking a stand against abuse, neglect, and exploitation, and together to continue our work building strong support for elders. Thanks so very much. Thank you for providing the opportunity for the Department of Justice to share with you some highlights of the Department's elder justice work and available resources on this important World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. I'm Susan Lynch, Senior Counsel for Elder Justice at the Department of Justice. 
Today, in the 615 format of this WEAD presentation, I will share with you first six facts about elder abuse, then the department's efforts in elder justice, and then five key department elder justice resources. Before I begin that discussion, let me start by saying the Department of Justice is deeply committed to ending elder abuse in all its forms. At the department, our lawyers, investigators, grant makers, policy makers, and professionals all work daily to advance the cause of elder justice. The work of the Department for Elder Justice is in the areas of enforcement, public awareness, training and technical assistance, and victim services and legal aid. Let me now talk about six facts about elder abuse, both in the community setting and in nursing homes. First, around one in six people, 60 years and older, experienced some form of elder abuse in community settings in the past year. Second, rates of abuse of older people have increased during the COVID-19 pandemic. Third, persons with a fiduciary duty that is to say guardians, powers of attorneys, can commit criminal financial exploitation. And fourth, five common financial scams committed against older adults include online shopping, business imposter scams, tech support scams, government impersonation, and finally, romance scams. I wanna share two facts about nursing homes. First, the rates of abuse of older people are high in institutions such as nursing homes, with two in three staff reporting that they've committed abuse in the past year. And second, financial exploitation and fraud occur in nursing homes, such as the deliberate misplacement or misuse of a resident's belongings or money without that resident's consent. Next, I wanna talk about DOJ's efforts and our commitment to continue our work in these areas. Components within the Department of Justice continue to actively investigate and pursue financial fraud, both domestically and internationally, targeting or affecting older Americans. In the areas of nursing homes, the National Nursing Home Initiative continues to pursue nursing homes that provide grossly substandard care to their residents and bring both civil and criminal cases where appropriate. The department continues to invest heavily in training, resources, and research to ensure our nation's elder justice professionals are equipped to respond vigorously and appropriately when fraud and abuse occur. The provision of direct and indirect victim services will continue to be a priority for the Department of Justice to promote recovery, safety, and well being. And finally, the department is committed to raising public awareness of elder abuse, neglect, financial exploitation, and fraud. I next wanna talk about the Department of Justice resources to combat elder abuse and financial exploitation all across the country and the world. First, the Elder Justice Symposium. This symposium on decision-making capacity was held by the department virtually in April of this year. Every day, the lives of older adults are profoundly and negatively impacted in both the criminal and civil justice systems based on mistaken assumptions and inadequate assessments of their capacity to make decisions for themselves. Criminal and civil cases are not pursued, unwarranted guardianships are imposed, and older adults may not testify due to presumptions about decision-making capacity. Attended by more than 1,500 elder justice professionals from every state and the District of Columbia, this symposium addressed access to justice issues for older adults when elder abuse cases involving possible diminished capacity occur. There was a rich agenda with 20 speakers over three days. The Elder Justice website will host materials from this symposium, including session recordings, resource guides, and literature reviews. Please check back frequently to see the new materials that have been added from this important symposium. Our second resource that I want to highlight for you today is the Judicial Guardianship Evaluation Worksheet. The Elder Justice Initiative supported the University of Southern California in developing this Judicial Guardianship Evaluation Worksheet. It was released in April of this year. This two-page worksheet provides guidance to judges in integrating information from various sources when making capacity determinations in guardianship cases. 
The worksheet and related materials are on the Elder Justice website's guardianship page. There is also a webinar on the use of the, web, the worksheet, which is scheduled for June 21st of this year. You can register to attend through the Elder Justice website as well. The third resource I'd like to share with you today is SAFE, Safe Accessible Forensic Interviewing for Elders. We wanted to alert you to the forthcoming forensic interviewing curriculum, which is due to be released at the end of June this year. The Elder Justice Initiative supported Model Consulting Group to develop this curriculum. It is intended to meet the growing need for legally defensible yet sensitive interviewing techniques for use with older adults in criminal contexts. SAFE is founded in forensic interviewing best practices with considerations and adaptations to account for age-related declines in cognition, underlying neuropathology, such as dementia and Alzheimer's disease, coexisting individual disability, mental health disorders, language capacity, and issues in cultural background. The curriculum is designed for forensic interviewers and elder justice professionals who interview or communicate with older adults who may be the victim of elder abuse. Again, please check the Elder Justice website in the coming weeks for information on this particular interviewing module. The fourth resource that I wanna share with you today is about elder justice coalitions. State elder justice coalitions engage in statewide coordination and collaboration among systems such as adult protective services, law enforcement, aging services, and many others. To spur the development of state justice coalitions, the department's OVC, or Office of Victims of Crime, will fund one entity to make and monitor subgrants to seven state elder justice coalitions and support them and other established coalitions across the United States through the provision of technical assistance. Information on this particular issue may be found at the Office of Victim of Crime, Office of Justice Program section of the Department of Justice website. And finally, the fifth resource that I'd like to share with you is a department's ongoing effort that I really wanna highlight, and that is the National Elder Fraud Hotline. The Department of Justice funds the National Elder Fraud Hotline. So please spread the word of this valuable resource specifically developed to help older fraud victims. This National Elder Fraud Hotline is to be called at 1-833-372-8311. On this hotline, you'll find highly trained professional operators available to assist older victims and their families with reporting and importantly, connecting them to important resources to help. Many of the resources that I talked about today are available on the department's elder justice website, which can be found at elderjustice.gov. And as you can see here, there's information for many elder justice professionals, prosecutors, victim services professionals, the multidisciplinary team center and others. So please check back at elderjustice.gov. Let us continue to work together to combat elder abuse neglect and financial exploitation. On this important day of WIAD, this work is absolutely critical. It is critical not only today, but it is critical every day of the year. Thank you. Hello, my name is Suzanne McGovern. I am with the US Securities and Exchange Commission uh, in the Office of Investor Education and Advocacy. And I am happy to be here today to highlight uh, World Elder Abuse Awareness Day and participate in the WEAD 615 Challenge. So here we go. Whenever a government agent speaks to you, we always have a disclaimer, and this is ours. The U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission disclaims responsibility for any private publication or statement of any SEC employee or commissioner. This presentation expresses my views and does not necessarily reflect those of the commission, the commissioners or members of the staff. So six facts today uh, in the challenge. The SEC's fact number one, adding a trusted contact on your investment account is important. What is a trusted contact? A trusted contact is a person you authorize your financial firm to contact in very limited circumstances where there is a concern about activity in your account 
or they are unable to get in touch with you. A trusted contact could be a family member, an attorney, an accountant, or another third party who you would believe would respect your privacy and know how to handle your responsibility. You may establish more than one trusted contact. This person cannot execute trades in your account or take money out, but if the firm can't get in touch with you, they have somebody to contact to find out where you are, how to get in touch with you, and discuss their concerns. Fact number two, broker dealers and mutual fund companies can hold transactions, that's a buy or a sell, or disbursements, sending money out, belonging to investors age 65 and older, or those with mental or physical impairments that the firm reasonably believes makes it difficult for these investors to protect their own financial interests. If a firm suspects financial exploitation, it may put a hold on such transactions or disbursements from an account for up to 15 days. The firm must conduct an investigation and attempt to notify the account holder or the, uh, and or the trusted contact on the account. If the firm gathers information that supports its suspicion of financial exploitation, it may continue to hold the transactions or disbursements for another 10 days. And the firm may extend the temporary hold for an additional 30 days if it has reported the matter to the state when they're doing the investigation. Fact number three, a background check on any financial professional is one way to help you avoid investment fraud. Uh, check the registration status and the background of any financial professional before becoming a client. Even if a close friend or someone you know uh, has recommended them. An easy way to check out a financial professional is to use the free search tool right there above on investor.gov, which will direct you to uh, the SEC's Investment Advisor Public Disclosure website. You can also visit FINRA, our SRO's uh, broker check program uh, and or your state securities regulator to get background information on an investment professional. What kind of information do you get? You get employment history, you get uh, licenses they hold, and most importantly, disclosures. Check and see if they have been investigated by a regulatory authority, they have customer complaints, or they've filed for bankruptcy, just as examples. Fact number four, the customer relationship summary, a new document that firms are required to submit, help seniors and all retail investors to better understand the services, costs, and important information about investment firms and professionals. Fact number five, protect your investments by watching out for these red flags of fraud uh, on investment fraud. Unlicensed or, uh, investment professionals, we have seen a lot of fraud happens when you are dealing with investment professionals that are not registered with us. Aggressive sellers who may provide uh, exaggerated or false credentials. Offers that sound too good to be true. We all know this, they usually are. Risk-free investment opportunities. All investments have risk. So that should be the first red flag if you hear that. Promises of great wealth or guaranteed returns. Those are usually uh, not true. If everybody is buying it, they pitch that to you. I've heard even my mother has bought it. Make, stop, think, pause. May not be a good thing to do. Over the top sensational pitches that may have fake testimonials, even from celebrities. That should be a red flag for you too. Stop and do your own due diligence. Um, ask to pay for investments with a credit card or gift card. Both of those should be a giant red flag for you. We do not usually in this industry 
accept payment by credit card or gift card um, or wiring money abroad. That should be a red flag to you. Usually these fraudsters are overseas. Once the money goes over there, it's very, very difficult to get it back. Fact number six, we have the retail strategy task force in our division of enforcement. And it was created to develop proactive initiatives for the SEC that will identify fraudulent activity affecting retail investors, especially senior investors. Uh, they're based on the task force broad history of cases against fraud targeting retail investors. They use a lot of data uh, where they can help them detect large scale misconduct. So uh, there have been, if you go to sec.gov and go to the Retail Strategy Task Force, you too can read about uh, scams that have affected senior investors. One example recently is a Ponzi scheme that uh, raised $110 million from 400 investors, many of them elderly retirees, offering membership units in an investment fund. The complaint alleges that defendants and their representatives told investors that their investments were safe, would be used for different investment activities, and would pay a fixed rate of return, uh, and they could get their money back at any time. Uh, according to our enforcement folks, these statements were false and misleading. They, the fund did not earn any profits, and the uh, investors lost their money. So there's many more like that. Uh, bad actors are out there. So you have to really be careful when somebody approaches you about uh, an investment opportunity. Think of those red flags and do a background check. The SEC pledges um, and the Office of Investor Education and Advocacy will keep issuing investor alerts and bulletins to inform investors of current schemes and educational information for seniors and all investors. Check out investor.gov uh, uh, and you can find these uh, uh, alerts and bulletins to keep you informed. And resources, five resources from the US Securities and Exchange Commission's Office of Investor Education and Advocacy. Investor.gov, number one place for you to go. Go to our senior page and see the most recent scams, frauds, uh, information on uh, important things you should know when investing. Uh, number two, uh, we have an investment bulletin on diminished capacity. This includes things you should think about uh, as you get older, what kind of documents you should gather in case something happens to you and you're not able to get that information to your loved ones or beneficiaries. Um, things like bank statements, where your will is, do you have a power of attorney, do you have a uh, health care power of attorney, and all your contact information for your investments, for your insurance, for your bank, and the like. Uh, Investor.gov also has information on el elder fraud. Elders are always targeted because one, you have the money, and two, they tend to uh, talk to you about your grandchildren or your family members and start to get you worried. So read the uh, bulletin on elder fraud. Uh, we also have a page on how the SEC works to protect senior investors. We do a lot here in our exam program, in our division of enforcement, in our office of investor advocate, um, in our uh, investor education. There's a lot that goes on here to protect senior investors. And check out the Senior Safe Act fact sheet. Uh, if something does go wrong, go wrong, talk to your firm and see if they can help you do an investigation if you think you've been defrauded in your investment account. And with that, I am done. I hope this has been very informative 
and please go to investor.gov. Good afternoon. My name is Lydia Chevere. I am a public affairs specialist with the Social Security Administration, and I am very grateful to be here today participating in the webinar Federal Partners Take on the We at 615 Challenge. Our agency is absolutely committed um, to doing all we can do to protect older adults from abuse, neglect, and financial exploitation. Millions of older adults rely on our programs for their economic security. In fact, 90% of Americans age 65 and older receive Social Security benefits. For too many, that financial security is threatened by scams and financial abuse. In recent years, Social Security scam became the number one government imposter scam reported to the FTC. These scams cause untold hardships, stress, and loss to our beneficiaries and their family members. Some of the biggest losses um, impacted people over the age of 80. And uh, for those age 80 and over, Social Security's Office of the Inspector General determined that the medium fraud loss amount was $2,000 for uh, calendar, calendar year 2021. Um, at Social Security, our goal is to help reduce financial abuse and victimization. To achieve this, we will continue to be an active member of the Elder Justice Coordinating Council and work with our federal partner agencies to help prevent elder abuse, neglect, and financial exploitation. We're also going to continue to work in conjunction with our Office of Inspector General, also known as OIG, to combat Social Security's related scam and raise public awareness. Today, I will be sharing along with my federal colleagues some important facts about elder abuse, as well as tips and resources to help you and others fight elder abuse. Uh, here are six key facts about elder abuse. Uh, number one, one of the most commonly reported types of elder abuse is financial exploitation. And financial exploitation is the illegal, unauthorized, or improper use of an individual's resources. Number two, financial abuse is often subtle and gradual and can be hard to detect or recognize. Number three, financial abuse is often carried out by trusted individuals, such as family members, caregivers, and servers, service coordinators. Number four, preventing elder uh, financial abuse is an issue of equity. For example, uh, some studies have shown that communities of color uh, may be disproportionately impacted by um, elder abuse. Number five, it is often difficult for scam victims to provide proof of their own victimization. Uh, criminals often ask for payments in the form of gift cards, prepaid debit card, internet currency, or by mailing cash because these formal payments are hard to trace and victims must provide documents that uh, substantiate the financial losses so they can become eligible for any relief that may be available to them. Uh, number six, financial exploitation causes untold harm and can affect a person's overall health and well being. One of the most powerful tools against elder abuse is public education, as well as access to resources and information. Here are five easy to use resources to help you and others guard against social security fraud. Number one, we recommend you check out our fraud prevention and reporting page at ssa.gov forward slash fraud to learn about social security fraud and how we fight fraudsters, criminals really. Number two, visit our, our Protect Yourself from Social Security Scams page 
at ssa.gov forward slash scam to learn what tactics scammers use and how to protect yourself. Number three, stay one step ahead of scammers by creating your own personal My Social Security account and reviewing your information. You can do that at ssa.gov forward slash my account. Number four, learn about other types of scams on our Office of the Inspector General Scam Awareness page at oig.ssa.gov forward slash scam hyphen awareness forward slash scam hyphen alert. And lastly, read one of our many blog posts on how to guard your social security card and protect your personal information at blog.ssa.gov. I hope you found the information shared today to you uh, of value to you, both to you and your networks. I want to thank you for your attention and your interest and desire to keep others informed. Uh, together, we can make ending elder abuse, neglect, and financial exploitation a reality. Thank you. Hello, my name is Deborah Royster, and I'm Assistant Director of the Office for Older Americans at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Before we begin our presentation, we have a brief disclaimer. This presentation is being made by a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau representative on behalf of the Bureau. It does not constitute legal interpretation, guidance, or advice of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Any opinions or views stated by the presenter are the presenter's own views and may not represent the Bureau's views. If you're not familiar with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, let me tell you a bit about us. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's mission is to help consumer finance markets work by making rules more effective, by consistently and fairly enforcing those rules, and by empowering consumers to take more control over their economic lives. We are a federal consumer financial protection agency with a focus on financial protection. So if you have trouble with a bank, a lender, or a credit bureau treating you unfairly, then the CFPB is a place where you can turn for help. The Office for Older Americans engages in research, policy, and educational initiatives to help protect older consumers from financial harm and to help them in key financial moments as they grow older. Many of our resources are targeted towards older adults age 62 and older, financial caregivers or professionals who interact with older adults, and others. The Office for Older Americans also has several resources specifically for financial institutions, including reports, advisories, and free consumer education resources. We are happy to partner with the National Center on Elder Abuse for today's webinar. They put out a call for the 615 challenge and CFPB is up for this challenge in commemoration of World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. Now I'll turn the program over to Aaron Scheithe from the OA team to get us started with the number six. Thank you so much, Deborah. You'll see on slide six facts about elder abuse that everyone should know, and I'm going to talk through these briefly. For the first one, contrary to what many people might think, older adults don't experience fraud more than other parts of the population but they do tend to experience greater financial losses than some other groups. Second, some of the most common types of scams in the past couple of years have been online shopping, tech support, romance, lottery, and grandparent scams. Third, older adults lose a lot of money to romance scams, about 139 million in 2020, and the dollar losses are on the rise. Four, scammers know what they're doing when they ask for payment by hard to trace methods. 
it's nearly impossible to get that lost money back when it's sent the ways that are outlined in the fourth tidbit. Number five, our Elder Fraud Prevention and Response Network Development Guide, which is available at consumerfinance.gov slash elder networks, is a tool you can use to start or re-energize an Elder Fraud Prevention Network, MDT, or FAST in your community. And number six, finally, if you have any issues with financial products or services, we encourage you to submit a complaint to us at the CFPB. Even if we're not the right place for your complaint, we can forward it to the right federal agency. You can also report fraud to our colleagues at the Federal Trade Commission at reportfraud.ftc.gov. Now I'd like to share CFPB's pledge in the prevention of elder abuse. We are committed to the Elder Fraud Prevention and Response Network Initiative that I mentioned on the previous slide. The CFPB Office for Older Americans helps communities form or re-energize networks made up of aging service providers, financial institutions, law enforcement, and other community stakeholders invested in the fight against elder abuse. That probably includes you, a member of the audience of this WEAD webinar. So please consider joining a network in your own community. And the fifth part of the 615 challenge is that we were challenged to share five resources. And honestly, it was a challenge for us to share only five. You'll see on your screen a variety of resources and educational offerings to help you, your clients, and others safeguard their finances as they grow older including our Money Smart for Older Adults program, the fraud prevention resources, including placemats, handouts, bookmarks, and posters, managing someone else's money and considering a financial caregiver, two resources available to help older adults plan for their financial future. And last but not least, the Elder Fraud Prevention and Response Network Development Guide, Again, you can find all of these resources at consumerfinance.gov. And last, I'll put our website up on the screen. It's consumerfinance.gov slash older Americans. And you can reach us at olderamericans at cfpb.gov. We are always looking to connect. So drop us a line or visit our website. Thank you so much to the National Center on Elder Abuse for hosting this webinar. Hello everyone, I'm Nicole Liebau, the Director of the Senior Medicare Patrol Resource Center. I appreciate the opportunity to be part of the panel of speakers today in hopes of raising awareness for elder abuse. Today, I'm talking about how to prevent a specific type of elder abuse, which is Medicare fraud. So let's start by talking about six facts everyone should know about Medicare fraud. So first, did you know that Medicare loses billions of dollars each year due to fraud, errors, and abuse? Fraud is a big business for criminals. These losses are estimated at approximately $60 billion a year, though we are really not sure of that exact figure, it's really impossible to measure. Second, there are many types of Medicare fraud. One example is hospice fraud, in which fraudsters, they target individuals at assisted livings or nursing homes when their life expectancy actually exceeds six months. So these, fraudster, these fraudsters use high pressure and unsolicited marketing tactics to get people to agree to these unneeded hospice services. Another example is genetic testing fraud, in which a company represents, representatives actually offer free genetic tests to Medicare beneficiaries. These companies can steal people's medical identities, and they can also falsely bill Medicare, which is draining the Medicare program and that needed funds for the program. 
the beneficiary or the person that took the test could also then be stuck with a really big bill for a medically unnecessary genetic test that Medicare wouldn't cover. The third fact that I want to talk about is that everyone should know that there are three steps to prevent Medicare fraud. It's to protect, detect, and report. Protecting information is your best defense against healthcare fraud and abuse. Knowing how to detect suspicious activity can help you stop or prevent that healthcare fraud and abuse in its tracks. And if you suspect you've been a target of healthcare fraud, this helps you and others at risk for any of those healthcare scams. So to break that down, we have the fourth fact that I have here is on prevent. So one way to prevent Medicare fraud and other types of scams is to not answer the phone if you do not recognize that number. This is one way that scammers do try to contact people is over the phone. The fifth fact is on detect. So one of the best ways Medicare beneficiaries can detect fraud is by reviewing their Medicare statements. And then the sixth fact that I wanna talk about is that report. So when Medicare fraud errors and abuse are suspected or if you suspect them at all, report it immediately to your local senior Medicare patrol program. So the SMP program pledges to empower and assist Medicare beneficiaries, their families, and caregivers to prevent, detect, and report healthcare fraud errors and abuse through outreach, counseling, and education. Now, I would just like to wrap things up today with five resources for Medicare fraud prevention. The SMP Center website is a great resource and provides detailed information and resources about how to prevent Medicare fraud errors and abuse. The SMP Center also has a national Facebook page which spotlights important current information for Medicare beneficiaries, their families and caregivers. And those are also to help to prevent Medicare fraud. The third resource that I'd like to highlight is the My Healthcare Tracker, which is a fraud fighting tool. And it's available at no cost to beneficiaries through the SMP program. The trackers help beneficiaries to protect to prevent, detect, and report suspected Medicare fraud errors and abuse. They also provide a place for people to record healthcare services and products that they receive, and also to take notes about their medical appointments. They include important information, such as instructions on how to compare your healthcare services, tests, uh, medical equipment you might get uh, that are documented in the tracker to compare to it and to compare to your Medicare statements. So then you can really detect any um, issues with your healthcare coverage or with maybe fraudulent billing or errors. The fourth one is a variety of videos that are available to you on, the, on how to prevent, detect, and report Medicare fraud. One of them includes the how to read your MSN summary notice. It walks you through individual steps on how you can read them and then compare them as well to the tracker. And lastly, but not least, um, your local SMP is really an excellent resource for Medicare fraud prevention. You can find them at www.smpresource.org or by calling 877-808-2468. So to wrap up today, I just want to thank you so much for your time. Um, it's been a pleasure to speak to you all about the SMP program and some of our resources that we have. Uh, we hope that you learned something new about how to prevent Medicare fraud specifically. And then I hope that you also have learned so much more about the other types of elder abuse uh, prevention and education throughout this webinar today.
Well, it's great to be closing out our World Elder Abuse Awareness Day 615 challenge with all of you. It's been great to hear what the prior speakers have had to say. And now I'll add in my own two cents as the director of the National Center on Elder Abuse. Here are a few facts I think everybody should know about elder abuse. The first one, and this is hard, this is really hard, is that we have to admit to ourselves that any one of us can actually end up committing elder abuse. And like many of the people who do so, we may not have any bad intentions. Um, we're doing our best. We get stressed, we get overwhelmed. We don't wanna blame the victim, however, but it's really important for all of us to know deep in our hearts that this can happen to any of us, that any of us can actually can commit the act of elder abuse. Now, of course, the other side of that is any one of us can actually experience elder abuse. We may think we're experts, we're protected. We know so much about it. There's no way it can happen to us, but it can. Um, we're all growing older, hopefully. Um, many of us are growing wiser, not all of us. Um, but, you know, as we talk about why older adults might be more susceptible to being abused or neglected, it's true for any of us. None of us are immune. So it's important for us to internalize this idea as well and think about what we want to do to protect ourselves because we can use that knowledge to also help protect others. The third thing that's really important is that anybody with a demanding illness is at higher risk of abuse or neglect. Now, we have found, as have many others, that one in two people, 50% of people with Alzheimer's and other kinds of dementias or will be abused at some point during their illness. This is a very important fact for everybody to be aware of because I believe we can prevent this from happening. Not 100% of the time, but boy, we can get that one and two number way down from where it is right now. So we have to understand this, look at the high risk situations, anticipate what might be going on and really look at the prevention angle of things. Fourth fact, and this might come as a surprise to you, but I am really beginning to believe that one of the best ways to prevent elder abuse is to prevent child abuse. Why do I say that? Well. We know that child abuse through things like the ACEs, the Adverse Childhood Experience Studies, shows us that we end up with these sort of accumulated traumas, accumulated issues in our lives that may make us more or less resilient, more or less connected in social networks, more or less sure of ourselves, et cetera. And the more we can do to help children age in a healthy way, the more we can do to help people have really nice old ages where there's less of a risk of elder abuse or neglect. Fourth fact, ageism contributes to elder abuse. Well, you've heard about this before. I'm really glad that we're talking about ageism more than we used to. And what is ageism? It's nothing but a prejudice against our future selves. Issue of ageism is huge all across the world in familyizing older adults, thinking of older adults as less than, thinking of older adults who have a demanding illness as, as less than human, distancing ourselves from people who are older as though they're not the wonderful, fully realized human beings that they are. All of these things make it easier in our own heads to justify abuse or excuse abuse. So we really have to be careful about our ageist attitudes. Uh, one of the things that scares me a lot is that some older adults, sometimes we're ageist about ourselves and we actually think we deserve it. So we really have to get past ageism and talk about this a lot more, which of course leads us to my favorite fact, fact number six, which is, you know what? We can prevent elder abuse. And that's one of the things that's so great about World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. We're not just talking about some of the sad facts related to abuse and neglect, but we're also talking about prevention. All of us can do something to prevent elder abuse through planning, through empowerment, through building the kinds of societies and community supports that all of us want as we grow older in an aging society. And everybody who's listening to this 
cares enough to participate and to say, I want to be a member of a society in which it's safe and dignified and joyful to grow old. So what action are we going to take here at the National Center on Elder Abuse? Well, our promise to you is that we're going to gather and distribute high quality, so accurate, good information that people can use across the world. And now I'm going to tell you how to access some of that information. We have all, all kinds of resources for you, and they're free. So please avail yourselves of them. Let's talk about each one in turn here. There's TRIA, or the Training Resources on Elder Abuse. You want to give a lecture on elder abuse? Don't reinvent the wheel. Go to this resource, grab some slides, modify them to your heart's content, make them your own, and use them. We've got videos, slideshows. People have been very kind in providing uh, presentations they've given. We vetted them to make sure they're accurate. If you have any that you want to add to our website, we would invite you to help others as well. But meanwhile, feel free to use this resource for yourselves. Another thing we have for law enforcement folks is called EGLE, Elder Abuse Guide for Law Enforcement. And this is being used across the country and we know in a few other countries as well. The whole idea behind this is for law enforcement now to be more aware of what resources are available in your own communities as well as nationally. What kinds of questions should you ask? When does a bruise look suspicious? All kinds of information and, and checklists on this site um, that should help people who are investigating abuse or neglect. The Reframing Elder Abuse Project. This gets to what I was talking about earlier. We want to eliminate those ageist attitudes. We want to eliminate biases in our own conversations. I'm constantly checking myself. I'm constantly getting input from the team that I work with at the National Center who helped me make sure that my slides are getting reframed so that I'm not using language that I, that I ought not to use. It really helps us reimagine how we're talking about elder abuse. And it's a way to help improve public awareness, again, without demeaning older adults. So it really can help elevate all of our exchange when we're talking about abuse and neglect. We have STEEP, Supports and Tools for Elder Abuse Prevention. Again, take this, download it, make it your own, stick your own logo on it. But this is really easy information that you can use for public awareness. Um, it's customizable, so you can make it fit your own locale. Um, and it's a toolkit that we hope you'll find useful as we look at distributing resources to understand and prevent elder abuse from around the world. And finally, we have our NCEA publications library, things you could download available in multiple languages. Again, um, all free, and we hope that these are things that you'll use as you work to help and join us in preventing elder abuse and neglect. Thank you so much for participating in World Elder Abuse Awareness Day with all of us across the world. Fantastic. Now, thank you for those wonderful presentations and for our speakers for taking on the We Add 615 challenge. Uh, as you can see, there are so many important facts about elder abuse that we should all know. Numerous ways for individuals and agencies to prevent elder abuse, along with so many wonderful, rich resources to help us prevent elder abuse and promote justice for all of us as we all age. So now uh, we're going to move into the Q&A portion of today's webinar and go over some questions that were submitted during the session, as well as um, questions that were submitted at registration. Uh, as a reminder, you can still submit any questions that you may have through the Q&A box, so please do utilize that function. I do want to um, let you all know that we will be following up with the recording of today's session, as well as all the slides and all the wonderful facts and resources that were shared. So you will be receiving that via email in the next couple of days. So now I'd like to move into the Q&A portion. I know that um, our first question came in and Erin from CFPB jumped in, but I'm going to ask her to unmute herself and share more about um, any resources for durable power of attorney abuse prevention. So CFPB, if you can share more about that. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Kimmy, for the opportunity. 
Um, the CFPB offers our managing someone else's money guides for uh, lay fiduciaries. So anyone who is a financial caregiver in a more formal role than just looking over someone's shoulder at their budgeting worksheets or something like that. It's, it's something that has a legal element to it. Um, some of the types of fiduciaries are um, agents under a power of attorney, guardian, trustees, and representative payees. And our guides cover all of those roles. Um, so the question that was asked, there may be, um, they may be able to find some help from those guides. And so we're very happy to share those. Wonderful. Thank you so much for um, sharing that resource. And I know CFPB updates their resources regularly. So we do encourage you also to sign up for their updates as they have many great resources throughout the year. Um, next question we do have from Jess Brooks. Uh, just mentioned, I just completed a training on psychiatric advanced directives, PAD. How does this play into information being shared? And I believe Jess submitted that question during Suzanne's um, presentation through SEC. So if Suzanne, you have any specific resources that you can um, point Jess to? And Suzanne, I believe you are on mute if you're trying to answer this question. Suzanne, we're still not able to hear you, so we can circle. Okay. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Actually, we can hear you now. I'm back, I'm back, sorry. Great. Uh, we don't have specific information on psychiatric advanced directives, um, but I would, I would say it might be a, a good idea to look at what the CFPB has just um, discussed about helping others and um, maybe there's another agency who can address this. Uh, this is not really in my wheelhouse. Great, thank you for your answer. And we can definitely follow up with Jess um, with more information. Um, next question is for SSA, Lydia. Um, the question is also from Jess. Do you feel it's beneficial for all individuals who receive SSI, SSDI to create an account with the SSI administ SSA administration? And if you can also share more about the protections there too. Hi, uh, hi Kim. I'm, I believe that you're referring about the My Social Security account. And if that's the case, uh, for all of those listening, my SSA is a personal account, and it gives you immediate access to your Social Security information. Um, and in addition to that, we also, um, there's some letters that are posted available at the account. So the whole idea about opening your my SSA account is that you can access your personal information, but also um, conduct business with us online. So it's a way of keeping track of what's happening with your social security number and benefits. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia. Um, I'm not seeing any new questions that have been submitted. So we'll move on to some of the questions that were submitted during registration. Um, I believe perhaps ACL may be appropriate for this question. And it is, are there any plans to make federal dollars for adult protective services across the country permanent? So I know we have some ACL representatives that may be able to share. Hi, Kimmy, thank you so much for that question. This is Aisha Gurley Perry with ACL. As it stands right now, we don't have anything in um, written concrete to state that we're gonna make this money permanent. Thank you for answering that question. And if um, any updates are made, you will be hearing from our listserv too. So if you haven't signed up for a listserv, please do um, sign up to receive our updates as well as ACL updates. Um, I'm going to turn this over now and anybody on our panel can um, answer this question. If you have seen any innovative ways that community organizations have been involved in elder abuse prevention, not only during WEAD, but throughout the year, if you have any 
uh, nonprofit organizations locally or nationally that you have worked with and innovative strategies you can share? Absolutely. Um, this is Susan Lynch from the Department of Justice. Thank you for that question. Um, you know, part of our strategy in, in preventing elder abuse, neglect, and financial exploitation is working with our federal elder justice coordinators across the country, and they in turn um, work on their teams um, with, with many members of the community. And so members of the community include banking associations on the financial fraud side, include emergency medical services um, and, and medical examiners and so forth on the clinical side. And so these organizations really pull together not only federal, state, and local government, but also relevant associations um, in, in these teams. And I think that approach, both decentralized um, and in the community, is tremendously powerful. I should also say for those organizations that are um, you know, in tribal communities, there's also been um, connections between um, some of the elder justice coordinators in those communities and, and tribal organization groups. So again, bringing, um, bringing the prevention to the community, as Dr. Mosqueda said, I think is, is a critical strategy for all of us. And um, uh, if it's okay, I'll jump in and add add in one other because I think you know anything we can do toward prevention is good. And there's a program that I really think is is terrific um, called Time Slips, and it was created uh, by uh, MacArthur Fellow and, and Basting, and it really helps bring out the creativity and imagination of people with uh, who have dementing illnesses. She's used it in nursing homes, and and um, and people can use it in their own homes as well with a loved one. And I think it's just a lovely way to engage because oftentimes we don't know how to uh, with people who have a dementia. And one of the things I like about it is it can unlock some of the potential that people have, either verbal or physical movement, things like that, and unlock some of the imagination. Um, so I love the fact that it recognizes that there's still a wonderful person in there. Um, and I think it's a good way to help uh, prevent elder abuse from happening. Wonderful, thank you so much, Susan and Dr. Mosqueda for um, answering those questions because every community really does have different priorities and strengths and challenges when it comes to preventing and el addressing elder abuse. So it's um, wonderful to see how different communities, you know, tapping into your um, connections with the elder justice coordinators. There are 96 across the country. So knowing who that person is to reach out and um, bring to your community is really important. So thank you for um, answering those questions. Um, I'm gonna perhaps turn this question back to Susan then. Um, how can the court best assist elders in need of an elder abuse restraining order and some innovative strategies that you may have seen across states? Absolutely. So um, a couple of things I, I would mention here. One is um, obviously, you know, getting getting an attorney to represent you sometimes in the context of legal aid or a private attorney um, to, to hear your case and, and to identify the concerns you may have. I, as I mentioned during um, the presentation a, a few moments ago, on the Elder Justice website, um, we have something called In Your Neighborhood. And I think this is a really um, you know, powerful tool to identify a lawyer, um, someone to help you, whether it's um, you know a, a consultation with someone in Adult Protective Services, whether it's a consultation with an attorney or legal aid. And what you can do is you can go into that section of elderjustice.gov and go to the In Your Neighborhood link. It was that picture of a neighborhood. And it will show you, thank you very much. I um, really appreciate it from the NCEA team. Just put that, drop that in the, in, in the chat. And it will show you, you know, here's the legal aid in your community. And if you're somebody who's in California where you live, but your loved one is in Montana, you can put in that state and find that information. And so again, getting advice is, is absolutely critical. If there is a problem specifically with guardianship, you know, the department also has um, um, a page dedicated to guardianship where there are various sections um, in, in it dealing with the overview hearings and guardianship cases and resor resources about guardianship and alternatives. So, you know, I commend you to, to the website um, and, and definitely um, if you see something, say something. Wonderful, thank you so much for sharing that um, answer. And yes, that's a definite uh, neighborhood map that we really like to utilize during our technical assistance calls at the NCA as well. Not only does it show key players like Adult Protective Services, Ombudsman, et cetera, but 
um, different food programs, transportation programs, crime victims, compensation, et cetera. So that's a very comprehensive neighborhood map that we encourage you all to take a look at as well. We see some new questions coming into the Q&A uh, pod. So our first question is um, a question for social security. If a, once a victim of identity theft, are you prevented from signing up for a My Social Security online account? We have Lydia from SSA on the line. Yes, hi, so this is Lydia. Um, so uh, no, you are not prevented to signing up for a My Social Security account, um, but for the caller, we do have um, an authentication process for those people interested in opening an account. And um, it will ask five personal um, information that we hope you and only you know about it. Um, and, it, and after that, you create your own password and um, username, which you have to change the password every uh, six months, I believe it is. Um, but no, you're not prevented from opening an account if you've been a victim of identity theft. Thank you for answering this question. Um, and just circling back to um, another question that we had for Dr. Susan Lynch with DOJ, how can people find out who their elder justice coordinator is? Fantastic question. Um, so there are basically two ways. Um, one is you can contact me um, and send me an email and I will let you know who that person is. But if I do not, and, and my information is it are on the slides um, and I can circulate that um, through the chat. Um, if that response does not come quickly enough for you, um, every US attorney district um, has somebody who is an elder justice coordinator. So um, you know if, if you're not getting that information right away, you could call um, the US attorney's um, office in the district that you're in and ask, who, um, who that person is, and you'll be directed directly to that person. Some elder justice coordinators are criminal prosecutors, others are civil, but again, they are really the gateway into the elder justice work of that district. So either way, um, we will get you what you need. Wonderful, thank you so much for answering that question. Um, and I'm also seeing an important resource that was mentioned in the chat from Patrice Harris. I'm an advocate at a family justice center in Idaho who assists and files CPOs. I believe that means criminal protective orders for free. So look for family justice centers in your area as well when you're looking for uh, different protective orders. Uh, we only have a couple minutes left. So I'm gonna just open it up actually to our wonderful panelists to share any thoughts or even questions that you may have for one another as we close out today's session. This is Laura Mosqueda. Just a big thank you to you, Kimmy, and the whole NCEA team for organizing this. What, like, I just remember a few years ago, we were trying to get 20 states, 25 states, and now consistently we've got everybody um, in the U.S. represented um in including um indian nations and it's it's really wonderful to see um and uh, we really appreciate everybody joining us thank you dr mosqueda i'll open it up to anyone else on our panel this is Susan Lynch from DOJ. I would like to thank um, NCEA as a, as a true leader um, in the elder justice space. We've been partners for years, obviously, with the department, and we appreciate working together. And I think at this time, um, you know, when we're facing so many challenges for older adults from COVID to scams to, you know, high gas prices and, and, and many, many things in this country, I think it's really important um, that we have the hope um, and take heart that there are many out there supporting older adults on an important day like today. So thank you to NCEA in particular. This is Suzanne McGovern from the SEC. I would like to also thank the NCEA and the whole team. Uh, this has been a growing, wonderful event every year, so thank you. And I'd really like to thank all the people who joined us today. Obviously, you all are uh, champions and champions of this cause, and keep up the good work because uh, that's our goal is to stop this. So thank you all. And this is Aisha from ACL. I would like to echo my federal partners with the same sentiment as well as NCEA. Thank you so much for hosting this as you have in the 
over the past several years. We truly appreciate you guys' effort and making sure this goes off without any issues or any concerns. Uh, again, thank you on behalf of ACL. Fantastic, and this will be um, the final round of thank yous. Thank you to each of our wonderful presenters and all of you for joining us today, again, to be together to raise awareness toward prevention on this important issue. Uh, thank you all for joining us on taking on this We at 615 challenge, and we now tag you to participate, um, all 222 of you that are um, sticking around to the Q&A. So um, after this webinar concludes, you will receive a short evaluation survey and we'll also type that into the chat. We would love your feedback. So on behalf of the National Center on Elder Abuse and the Federal WIAD Committee, thank you so much for joining us today and have a wonderful WIAD.